the curiosity, the, the lifelong learning, the idea of being a lifelong learner, that for us is very important. And then to create an independent and sort of self-sufficient human being. The keen interest in freedom and liberty that uh, children should be granted those same rights. You learn in every day and everything that you do. How have you fed to this point? All you considerate escaping the next round. Right crossing out the side door and into the Unschooling is often described as child-led learning or interest-led learning. It's like trusting them that whatever their passions are are going to link to all sorts of things and bring all sorts of things into their lives, into our lives too. Unschooling is a form of homeschooling, so it's an educational philosophy. It's where homeschooling could mean school at home where you're taking the same principles and applications used in school and just bringing them home. Unschooling is more not school. The idea that children should explore their interests actually goes back several hundred years. The earliest references I know about are the French philosopher Rousseau who proposed that basically adults should set up the environment and stay out of the way that the ch child has within him or her the capacity to learn and the adult's job was to set up the environment so that they could uh, sort of explore things. We're kind of right in the middle where when Veronica or Peter express some interest in some area, I put things in their way to get the things that I think should be in the curriculum into their area of interest. It was near the end of sixth grade for me, so we thought it wouldn't really be much use to go through to the end of sixth grade. So Madison has a good reputation as a, as a good uh, school district and has a very high spending per student, uh, dollars spent per student. What happened was, um, because my wife is a genius and she knows how uh, I think, <laughs> she said, um, yes, we recognize that Madison is a good school district. Uh, but here's a book from a guy named John Holt who talks about how the child can learn, how children are always learning. Uh, they're learning from birth. It is meant to be centered around the child and centered around your own abilities, the individual home as an individual school. I've been interested in a lot of like the classic vampire stories like Dracula by Bram Stoker or one of the newer ones like The Twilight by Stephanie Meyer and a lot of my friends from Mom's Queen Group are interested in that. Veronica has lately been into vampires, so my job is to put history uh, even grammar, uh, reading materials, beyond just sort of the formulaic books that she has in her path. When I was 15, I was given the Teenage Liberation Handbook by Grace Llewellyn, whose subtitle is How to Quit School and Get a Real Life in Education. That book changed my life absolutely fundamentally in every way changed my life. I had no idea that I didn't have to do what I was told, that I didn't have to go to school. I don't think I fully de-schooled, but I think that it made me see the value in learning things the way that an adult would learn things. You know, you learn through curiosity, through exploration, through um picking up books just because you're interested in it through searching the internet. But on the other hand, uh, the adult knew where to look through because of years of education. So all these things I just mentioned, computers and books and, and um, mathematical formulas, don't come about just through playing with stuff. Unschooling for us came really naturally with the way that we were already parenting. Um, we were following the children's lead as far as nursing and eating and all these things which are sort of the principles of unschooling too, like you follow the children's, um, what, what they 
what what their leads are. And um, I was in La Leche League with them, and a lot of the leaders in La Leche were also unschoolers. The whole philosophy of La Leche League is like that you nurse on demand, you don't put up your children on a schedule, and that's sort of like you know listening when the child says when the baby the baby knows it's what it needs most. It knows when it's hungry. It just made sense with everything, like not trying to control the children. Unschooling is perfectly legal. In Ohio, the rules are that I have to notify at the beginning of each year and turn in an assessment for the previous year with that notification. Homeschools are considered legally, as a legal entity, they're a private school. So we would be able to identify ourselves in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of the state, as a private school. We sort of gave an overview of all the possible academic subjects with descriptions of how we would learn those from life. As such, we could also have certain um, sort of rights and privileges that any other school would have. For example, if she has a school ID, she would get the same discount any student would have. Uh, but in terms of reporting to someone or checking, like sort of a checklist or certification that happens, um, not required in Illinois, and we don't do so. But I think published guidelines that people can follow and community groups of homeschoolers, which I know are very popular, for example, in Michigan, I know there's a big homeschooling movement there, and I don't know that much about Illinois, and it, they, um, they, they have informal ways of getting together that allow parents to talk to other parents and not do it in isolate. I worry about doing it totally in isolation because we do expect that culture to be, I mean, that child to be part of our culture, and our culture has should have certain shared values and certain things that we uh, want people to know, or we can't function as a society. We don't really do anything to say like they've learned. I don't keep track like they've learned their alphabet or their numbers or we've learned multiplication today or anything like that. But I think like in everything that we do, it all connects. In the beginning, I thought, you know, I actually thought no TV, no sugar, no video games. Like before I had kids, I had all these ideas of what kind of parent I would be. And the more and more we, you know, were unschooling and got exposed to them and saw other people playing video games, we started playing them. And I'm just amazed at what they learn in them. Like, you know, the spatial things of just being able to move around in the, in the video game, but also like the math that's involved in them and just reading. Rather than learning from symbols as we do, mathematics and text and things like that, the idea is that young children learn best through um, play with active materials. And actually, some of my research is sort of looking, looking at that assumption a little bit and thinking about both the positive benefits of that kind of play and learning and possible potential costs or disadvantages so that uh, parents or teachers can um, you know, maximize the benefits while minimizing the disadvantages. You can learn math through abstract concepts, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Or you could learn that two transformers against two whatever the bad guys are, are four robots fighting. Math is one of the great sort of debates of unschooling. Can you unschool math? Lots of people who are very interested in unschooling do not unschool math. In fact, choose to use a curriculum for their children. Could a child learn mathematics informally? Probably yes, but only if there were some attempt to recognize that they need um, experiences that would lead them in directions. But if you just say, will the default child like just put out in the environment, you know, with no um, specific desire for them to learn mathematics, with no guidance in that direction, how much will they learn? I think it's fairly limited. If you watch how the children figure these things out without being taught, like these are even numbers and these are odd. So there's two children, you know, that's an even number. And the way that Otto would first say it, the concept that he grasped it, he would say like, um, well, we have like 10 M&Ms, is that a fair choice? And he meant, like, is it fair? Will it be equally divided between the two of us? And then he just like kept taking it further and further. I remember being in school and doing a worksheet with pictures of money on it. It had a dollar bill and a five dollar bill and nickels and pennies and dimes. And in each problem, we were supposed to add up how much we had based on these, these pictures. I mean, this is a worksheet. This is a photograph of money. My kids go to the store and buy things, and that's how they learn what money is for and how to use it. The one question that makes all, almost all homeschoolers sort of roll their eyes at like, ugh, that seems like such a simplistic and, uh, and uninformed question is the question of the socialization of the child. Being social is part of what our species was designed for. We are a social animal.
Think about the word that they're choosing. Are you talking about socialization? Are you talking about the ability to socialize, to be a social person, to interact socially? I mean, these are all slightly different versions of the word, but that people sort of lump together as, is your kid normal? <laughs> and, you know, normal in their ability to talk to people? Of course. Uh, different? Aren't they all? I was a little nervous because these kids had been unschooling and homeschooling really their whole lives and they all knew each other and I was a little nervous but then I met them and, I, and they were they're really friendly. But the great thing is is that they don't have children that are all seven and four because they're not in classrooms where there are nothing but seven and four year olds. They have friends that are seven and four and seventy and forty and twenty three. They're, they're willing to engage with you as an individual whether or not you are older, whether or not you are a person of authority, you know what I mean, someone who might be perceived as uh, someone in authority, a policeman or a teacher or a professor, um, on a genuine human level. I would usually find like one or two really, really good friends, usually just one, and um, that then you would, you know, I'd be best friends with that person all through third grade, and then you would, it would turn fourth grade and that person was in a different class, and I never saw them anymore, and you were like ripped from that friendship. You know, that's what I, it was really, really hard for me as a kid. And for my kids, like, they're not terribly social, but they do have, like, three or four really good friends within the homeschooling community. Even the best school districts are constrained by their bureaucracy, are constrained by their sort of their attitudes towards managing the numbers of ch children as opposed to managing the individual child's education. Maybe we need to, to think more about schools, <laughs> um, allowing children to explore their interests more than giving up on schooling altogether. They don't have adequate access to appropriate materials. They don't have individual attention. They don't serve the needs of all the students because all the students are different. I, I felt like you were forced to learn you know, what they thought was important or, and, and if you got really interested in one thing, you couldn't keep following that thing. You had to go on to the next class. Oh, really? Colleges all over the United States accept homeschoolers. People are getting more and more open to homeschooling. Actually, universities are sometimes catering, you know, wanting homeschoolers. Many colleges don't require a high school diploma. To that end, they do what colleges ask them to. If they want to go to a university, they find out how to apply. That usually involves an application, or my child can write a loose narrative of the things they've been learning, or some sort of transcript. I would say that anybody can homeschool. I would say that anybody who wants to homeschool certainly can. But I think a lot of people, it's like a temperamental thing, because people just, um, people will say to me, no, I could never do that, or I wouldn't want to do that, or I can't wait for my kids to get out, and that just makes me really sad. You don't have to be wealthy or have a lot or have a high education. You just need to um, be devoted to your children. Everything just sort of ties in. I just feel like everything that they, if we just follow the passion and go com just delve into it completely, it just connects to everything. I think that giving them the world, instead of breaking it down into worksheets and standardized tests, is the best way, absolutely, to, to become a grown person who can support oneself and who loves to learn. Our culture sort of indoctrinates us to accept that there's an institution, there's a building, and there's a place where people can go, where children can go, and there are people in that institution who are going to do a better job of teaching your child than you could. Um, and we don't believe that. Thank you.